Good Tuesday morning, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and this is the Jerry and Jerry Show. Thank you kindly for joining us. Live in downtown Charlottesville, our studio about one mile from the John Paul Jones Arena and a mile from Scott Stadium. A lot to cover on today's show. We'll take a look at the transfer portal and potentially the transfer portal impacting positively the University of Virginia football team. We'll talk on today's talk show, Florida State, and I'll ask the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer himself, Jerry Ratcliffe, if the Seminoles got screwed by the CFP Selection Committee. Also on the program, the upside of Isaac McNeely. The sharpshooter is very much coming into his own. The kid against Syracuse could not miss, and his confidence is growing by the game. We'll talk Reese Beekman and his NFL, excuse me, his NBA upside, his draft stock, and his potential. Is Beekman playing himself into potentially a first round pick, potentially flirting with the lottery? Time will tell on that. Of course, Ryan Dunn, a lottery pick without question. And I want to ask Hootie Ratcliffe about Elijah Gertrude, a guy who he said on a previous edition of the Jerry and Jerry show is being compared to Justin Anderson with his athleticism and his explosiveness, and that absolutely boggles my mind because Justin Anderson was one of the best athletes I've ever seen in my time of watching Virginia basketball. That is a fantastic comparison if you're Mr. Gertrude. Judah Wickhauer, our director and producer, if we can go to the studio camera, then the two shot, and let's welcome a man who needs absolutely no introduction, an institution, an icon, a living legend, Jerry Ratcliffe. So much to cover, my friend. Where would you like to begin? Well, uh, thanks for the compliment. I can follow sweater. you around if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to the, for the compliment, my sweater. I'll have to credit uh, my friend Trent Thurston over at Eljo's. He selected this one for me. But uh, Trent's a good guy. He's a, he is. Yeah. He's terrific. Yeah. Him, him and his dad, all the guys over at Eljo's, um, enjoy stopping by there and just shooting the bull, if nothing else. But uh, those guys know their sports. Um, uh, we can start anywhere. Where would you like to start? Um, your fans, the viewers and listeners, want your take on the Florida State Seminoles. They go undefeated, power five, clean slate, ACC champions, the clear-cut best team in the Atlantic Coast Conference, and not an opportunity to play for a national championship. My friend, a lot of Seminoles left with a sour taste in their mouth. Well, you knew some fan base was going to get screwed. We, we see this happen every year. Uh, I mean, there's been years where the Big Ten was left out with good teams, uh, Big 12, although I still think a lot of the Big 12 teams don't play defense, so I think that hurts them. But uh, we've seen it in the past with the Pac-12. I guess it was the ACC's turn. <laughs> uh, all this could have been avoided if they'd have done what uh, – I used to go see Gene Corrigan – uh, rest his soul, uh, who was one of the most brilliant sports minds I I've ever encountered. Um, he had a pulse on college athletics like nobody that I've ever run in encountered. We used to sit around at, at uh, Glenmore and talk about this, at having a salad, and we both agreed that all of this controversy, since they created the playoffs could have been avoided had they gone to an 18 playoff originally instead of a 14 playoff if you look each year almost every controversy they've had it's been over the five six right none of that stuff would have even existed had they had an 18 playoff everybody would have been happy every conference would, or every major conference would have had a a player if not two it's sometimes maybe even three um we would have that this year had the ACC and the alliance, the so-called alliance, which lasted, what, eight months before the Big Ten lied to everybody and blew it up. We would have a 12-team playoff right now if the ACC had not blocked it. They were a power player in blocking a 12-team playoff. We'd be having one right now. Uh, so they kind of shot themselves in the foot on that one. But uh, I could see it coming. Somebody was going to be unhappy. 
I, 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 as much as I've coll- uh, followed college football, and I'm a huge college football fan. You love college football. And I've been a proponent for 30 years for a playoff and not just a four-team playoff. I, I could see it coming that somebody was going to get shafted. I figured it was probably going to be Florida State because you knew that the winner of the Alabama-Georgia game was going to get a spot. I mean, that that was – that was automatic. I mean, that's the best conference in college football. You got Georgia, who had won 29 straight games, had dominated football. And you knew if Alabama beat them that they were going to get a spot. I, there were some proponents of having them both in the top four. Um, I would not have been shocked if that had happened. Um Alabama is playing as good as anybody in the country right now. They, they uh, when they lost to Texas in the first game of the season, they were so unsettled on offense and a quarterback. With they and they even benched Milrow. They were so unhappy with him early, and played poorly against South Florida as a result. Once they got that straightened out, they were a force to be reckoned with, and. I, so I, I, I was not surprised at all that the winner of that game made it in. Florida State thirteen and zero overall. Yeah, they they've beaten LSU, they've beaten Clemson, right? NC State, NC State, Florida State's Louisville, beaten uh, Louisville uh, in the conference championship. Uh, Florida State has beaten Florida. They've beaten Miami. Mm-hmm. They've done everything that they could possibly do to make a case to be in a four-team playoff to win a national championship. We can make an argument that Florida State's not playing their best football right now. They're certainly way less dynamic without a a starting quarterback in Jordan Travis who suffered a broken leg. Right. I feel for the Seminoles. Their got backup a, quarterback had a concussion and couldn't go. We got a third but stringer he, but under he should, But he should be back. For He'll them. be cleared. Yeah, That's what the talk is. The backup will be cleared. A lot of people saying this Florida State team didn't get in because of pedigree and because they don't come from a conference like the Southeastern Conference. A lot of people saying Florida State's not in this four-team playoff because they don't have a big-name head coach. I heard one talking head on one of the national networks saying, for example, if Deion Sanders was the head coach of Florida State, this team would be in the four-team playoff, because they'd have more brand appeal or panache or brand recognition. You buy any of this, Hootie? I don't buy that. I I don't think the committee considers that. I really don't. I think think what hurt Florida State more than anything was its strength of schedule, which was number 55 in the country, which is pretty low, I think, for a a team being considered for the Final Four. if you saw the last few weeks of the what the committee was doing, you could see Florida State kind of slipping. Uh, I think some of that was due to their quarterback getting injured. Absolutely. And even though they said that wasn't a factor, I, I think it had to be cause something that they considered. But I, I think the strength of schedule hurt them probably as much as anything because, I mean, you look – Alabama was number five. I don't know what Georgia and Texas were. But, um, I mean, being 55, that's... That's not great. It's not great. When you want to contend for a national championship. And Yeah, and, you know, some of that they could have controlled by maybe playing a little bit tougher non-conference schedule because they knew they knew the ACC was not going to be down. A, a, yeah, wasn't going to have a lot of top teams. So... Um, I don't. I don't remember who they played on the non-conference. Other than well, they played Florida and LSU, two pretty good teams, but only pretty good. Um, they just, you know, when you go head to head, they just didn't play probably enough top fifteen teams to help their case. Uh, that, that would be my guess because all those other teams did. I mean, Washington played uh, quite a few. Top 15, 20 teams. Um, Texas did out of the SC, uh, Big 12. So, and I think even out of the Big 12. But I, I think 
I think that what probably hurt them the most was their strength of schedule and the fact that they lost their quarterback, <clears throat> even though the committee didn't recognize that as a factor. Chad Wood, I'll get to your comments here in a matter of moments. Viewers and listeners in six states watching the program. Southern Miss on their out-of-conference schedule, along with LSU, along with Florida, along with, get this, North Alabama. So two rent, what do you call them, rent of victims? Rent of victims, yeah. Two rent of victims. And Florida wasn't exactly a, a great team this year either. But to Florida <clears throat> State's credit, the schedules are made in advance. Right. Clemson, no one anticipated this level of performance from the Tigers. No one perhaps anticipated this level of performance from the ACC in totality. I would say the ACC in totality, mediocre when compared to some of the other Power Fives, and that may be nice. No one anticipated this level of so-so-ness from the Gators. But to Hootie's point, you beat Louisville in the ACC championship 16-6. to Squeak by the Gators 24 to 15, and you get Miami 27 to 20. So to your credit, the last, what, three, three of the last four games of the year, certainly not convincing victories. Right. And, and uh, the committee, that's something that they look at, too, is how you're playing at the end of the year going in to the postseason. That's, uh, that's 100%. Some, that's Same something. with college basketball. Yeah, it's something that they yeah. look at. Uh, yeah. The, the, yeah, the college basketball committee does that. Uh, look at They look at your last five games, last ten games. They look at your strength of schedule. They look at how you play on the road. Uh, a lot of factors like that. <clears throat> I'm sure the football committee does similar things when they're looking at and, and the football committee had – I don't know exactly who's on it now because it switched over. I do know that there's some some uh, former coaches on that committee. So um, it's not like that they have people that don't know football in it. So um, James Watson's got a great question from you. Yeah. He's a University of Virginia graduate. James Watson bleeds orange and blue. Chad Wood will go to you next. Bill McChesney, welcome to the program. Viewers and listeners, jump in with questions and comments for the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, the publisher of jerryratcliffe.com. Hootie Ratcliffe is in the house. James Watson, very specific. Do you gentlemen think this will nudge Florida State over the cliff in terms of leaving the Atlantic Coast Conference? Well, it could because I think they want to leave anyway, but and maybe they're just looking for a good excuse. But if you are Florida State and you, you're, you want your destination to be the SEC, which – that's what a lot of the scuttlebutt is. Do you really want to jump into that fire? I mean, if Florida State had played a SEC schedule this year, they wouldn't be 13 and 0. Absolutely not. They wouldn't. They they would probably have two or three losses, in my estimation. Because certainly, with their starting quarterback getting banged up. Yeah, and um, you know that, that may prompt them to do so, but I don't know. I mean, I, I have a a friend who's close to Dabo Sweeney and all this racket about Clemson wanting to jump in the SEC. I, this guy told me that Dabo doesn't want to go into the SEC because Clemson becomes ordinary. Right. And uh, if they have a chance in the ACC to do things that they probably wouldn't do in, if they were a member of the SEC. So, And the SEC is only going to get better because – Texas and Oklahoma are joining this year. Uh, Chad Wood, next in line, my friend. We'll get to Chad's comments here in a matter of moments. Um, Chad says, um, OSU had a backup a few, few, few years ago on Cardell Jones. The committee did not mind then when Cardell Jones was uh, the backup quarterback thrust into the starting position. Chad Wood says, this is complete BS. They wanted Alabama so bad, they had to put Texas in also to justify it. It won't happen, but the ACC should boycott this year's bowl games. This is ridiculous. Chad Wood says, so if a recruit wants to compete for a national title, they should not consider the ACC, right? That's the message that's being sent by the committee. If you win all your games, you still might not get in. Of course, changes are, changes are coming next year, but it's a terrible look for college football. Your thoughts on those? Well, like I said, it's happened before. It happens every year. I mean, some some teams get left out, whether they're undefeated or not. 
whether they've lost a quarterback or a key player or not, um, that that didn't keep these other programs from <laughs> from coming back the next year and and playing well and and trying to get into the playoffs. Uh, nobody boycotted bowls or any of that stuff. I mean, somebody's somebody's going to get left out. It's just the way it is. Uh, I think the Big 12 was considered stronger than the ACC. The Pac-12 was considered stronger than the ACC. Uh, and it's fallen apart. Um, but, yeah, I, I, th- I don't know if they wanted Alabama – if Alabama had lost the game, certainly they wouldn't have. If Alabama had lost, they had no chance. Alabama yeah, made a convincing no argument. All. Alabama made a convincing argument to get in by beating one of the best football teams we've seen this generation. Yeah, um, I mean they were. Uh, Georgia was a dynasty. They were building a dynasty, and they're still still a dynasty. Yeah, I mean they, yeah. they've only lost one game, and they they're going to play. Florida State will get a chance to show people how good they are because they're going to be playing or, Georgia. In the Orange Bowl, right? Or, or show us how vulnerable they are. True. And, and and when Florida State plays Georgia, a lot of people – It's we, we may have to swallow this pill, Florida State fans, and you may not want to hear this. When Florida State plays Georgia, and if Georgia wins convincingly, that's only going to back the argument that the CFP made the right decision. Absolutely. Um, you're no getting this, this question from uh, Donald Marcella. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's saying the ACC will be half itself in two years. Prove me otherwise. I mean that that's a possibility. Uh, again, that we got the grant of rights thing. Uh, if if anybody pulls that trigger, it's going to cost them millions and millions of dollars. I I don't know if anybody wants to go there or not. Um, we saw that Texas and Oklahoma delayed their departure from the Big Twelve for that very reason until their contract expired because they didn't want to forfeit those, those, that kind of money. I mean, if you're, lo- if you're bleeding millions and millions of dollars and you're an athletic program, you're, I mean, most, a lot of athletic programs are losing money to begin with. Well, you mentioned on previous shows that Virginia football losing about a million dollars a home game. Yeah, but I, I'm talking about TV. Oh, revenue. I get it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. Uh, somebody said that if Florida State exited, they could lose a hundred million dollars. I mean, where are you going to make that money up? From? That's a lot of money. Uh, That's a lot of money. Yeah, but uh, I mean, you know, they could be, they could, they could leave, uh, and depend on their fan base, their donors, to make up the money and, and get it from joining another conference. Although uh, I, I've been told through some of the circles that I, I, I talk to people in that uh, a lot of the other conferences were turned off by Florida State for making all the noise and putting down their own conference when they were uh, barking, as we talked about it several months ago, uh, complaining about uh, various factors of being a member of the ACC. And it turned off some other conferences. So I, I don't I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what develops. Uh, that is one reason why the ACC expanded and brought in SMU and Cal and Stanford, because if your membership drops below 14, then the ESPN can renegotiate your TV rights, and that contract goes out the window. And that's and a death that's, now. That's why they brought those teams in, because yeah. if Florida State and Clemson would leave, they would still have more than 14 teams in the fold. So um, I, it's it's the wacky days of college, college athletics that we've never seen before, never dreamed of. Who knows what's going to happen next week, let alone – Two years from now. Thomas McCarthy watching the program. Thomas, welcome to the program. UVA alum Jill Jill Stetch watching the program. Um, thank you for watching the show. Jill, on Twitter, we have Tennessee viewers and listeners, Virginia viewers and listeners, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Pennsylvania, 
Michigan, and upstate New York on the program right now. Viewers and listeners, shape the discussion by putting your thoughts in the comment section. We will mention them live on air. Florida State fans, we understand your frustration. This frustration may be alleviated next year when the selection committee has more options and, and more invitations to extend. Absolutely. 12-team uh, playoff next year. I love that. I, I love it. I, I don't like the idea that four teams are going to get a bye. I would have rather had a, either an eight-team or a 16-team playoff. I, I, don't like, I don't like the idea of buys. I, I don't care what kind of year you had. I, I, I think if you're having a playoff, I don't think you should have a bye. But uh, that's part of it. It's better than what we have now. Definitely. Um, and, again, we could have had it this year had the ACC not blocked it. And they wouldn't, there wouldn't be any towels to cry on. But uh, that's, that's the world we live in in college athletics. From college football playoffs, guys, we're going to go to the transfer portal and we'll talk Wahoo football. Tony Elliott's team, by the grace of God, if you're not a God-fearing person, maybe by the luck of the Irish, uh, they have not lost a player of significance as of this point. And this is 10.38 in the morning on <laughs> December 5th. So remember, I'm time stamping this, okay? Anything can happen. The portal's brand new, just opened. Um, just opened so 12 hours ago. 12 hours ago. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this again. As of 10.39 a.m., they have not lost a player of significance. They have lost um, some players, but no one, and I, and I hate to say this because they're college football players and not pro players, uh, no one of uh, noteworthy playing time. I think that's safe to say. Yeah. Um, no starters, no uh, part-time starters. Yeah. Only you have a fantastic story on this on jerryratcliffe.com. Yeah, the portal opened at 10 o'clock last night. There's, uh, as of midnight, there were over 1,000 FBS players in the portal, <laughs> which is kind of mind-blowing in itself. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. Uh, Tony Elliott and his staff have done a great job of recruiting in their own locker room and retaining players, like you said, timestamp as of right now. 1040. <laughs> <laughs> Anything can change. Um, but they, they have. They have done a, a good job. I had heard rumors of uh, mass exodus, which at, at least at this point has not occurred. Uh, which tells me that these guys are bought into what he's selling. And uh, the, the guys that they have lost, as we said, were either reserves and didn't play much or didn't play at all. There were some freshmen and redshirt freshmen, uh, some of whom perhaps had a future here, but uh, maybe not. Who knows? Uh, we, didn't, we didn't get a chance to see them play. And... If if you didn't play on in on this year's team, which was struggling mightily at times, says so something maybe about your upside. And and yeah, I had some injuries and needed guys to step up. If if those guys didn't step up, there might be yeah, that might be a telltale sign that maybe they weren't cut out for this program after all. But. Um, yeah, that you have to give them a big salute for being able to hold on, at least at this point, to what, what they've got. Um, we'll highlight some of the viewers and listeners watching the program. Jer Jeremy Hancock, welcome to the show. Grayson, we'll get to your comments in a matter of moments. Viewers and listeners, you can ask Hootie and I some questions by putting them in the feed. Anywhere you are watching, we'll watch them live. We'll mention the questions live on air. It's interesting, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this to you here. Virginia football clearly had a disappointing year. In fact, maybe it's not disappointing. The odds makers in Vegas predicted what three and a half victories. That was the over under. That was the over under. Yeah, three and a half. So they're and, right there. And they they, they sh actually should have. They should have been way over. Beaten that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but basically finished on the uh, on the line, the over under line, right? So maybe this is the pitch to the locker room. We struggled. You guys have experience. Stay with the program. You'll help us turn the ship and help us get more wins in the win column. Um, different, perhaps, than, say, a dominant or winning program that's got a starter, a backup, and a third stringer ready to go, and then you see a fight for minutes. Tony Elliott can go to these guys and say, stay with me, and you will get playing time next year. Look, we need you. Yep. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I, I just glanced at a couple of things. And uh, Ohio State, for example, I think they had at least 12 guys in the portal last night. So that's that points exactly to what you just said. Um, but, yeah, those are all selling points for Tony Elliott. Um, I, I think from talking to a, a lot of these players throughout the season, I, I think they believe in him and his staff. They, they really – that know that the coaches care for them, they want to take care of them, they want to win. Uh, they're busting their hump. I know they're working very hard uh, every week in trying to get their team prepared to win. And, and you could see that at times. There were, there were games where, I mean, there were so many close games that could have gone either way, Jerry. had And... and we know that because Bronco told us that. Mike Linden told us that. Uh, we've heard Tony Elliott say it. Most ACC games come down to a handful of plays, and that, that's lived we itself saw it. out in, in most cases. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions. But, um, yeah, they, they, had, uh, they had some really interesting moments, I thought, this year. And, had they scheduled a little smarter, I, I think they probably would have won a couple more games. Uh, not playing Maryland on the road, Tennessee on the road, instead of playing two rental victims, <laughs> so to speak, um, where you, you you're favored to win, and you know they they could have won five or six games and been bowl eligible had they done something like that. Um, Possibly been bowl eligible, but how how much? I'll throw this to you here, um, viewers and listeners. Let us know your thoughts on this question, and this may be a tough question for you to swallow, but it may be influencing why the team right now has not had uh, some of its key players enter the portal. How much of team stability, and how much of um, minimizing attrition, has come from the athletic department staying committed? to its coaches and not making any staff changes? I think, I think that's a, a very important because George Welsh used to say one of the keys to his consistent winning program over 16, 17 years was continuity in the coaching staff. Um, not only does that help the program in that the coaches know – they're, they can trust each other. They know what each other's doing. They know how to work together uh, to make it a smooth running machine. But the players know that, hey, my position coach is not going anywhere. Uh, I like him. I believe in him. He's going to help me. Uh, that, I think that's a big deal to players, that their their coaches are – are staying in place. A, a lot of comfort, familiarity, uh, confidence is built from that. Tough question for you. The toughest one I've asked you so far. If your gut or your instinct had to make a crystal ball prediction on key player, important player, jumping into the portal, what would your gut or instinct – who would your gut or instinct pick? I think they got to keep Calandria. Uh, he's – even though he's a freshman, he's – pictured as the leader of this football He's the team. face. He's the face of the program right yeah. now, even though Tony Musket may rank ahead of him in, in starting pecking order when he's healthy, but that may no longer be true either. It'll be an open competition. But I think uh, Calandria is a very personable guy. I think uh, his teammates have a lot of confidence in him. They've seen what he can do. They've heard what other coaches have said about him. That They're willing to play for him. They're willing to play for him. You got to rally around somebody. Usually, it's your quarterback, and uh, he's a talented guy. He's an exciting player. He's got. He's given the fan base hope. That's all fan bases want, uh, other than wins, is is hope. And he, he's fun to watch. He's uh, he's has no fear. He's a gunslinger. Uh, he's a gunslinger. He's, yeah. he's the kind of guy that can help turn a program around. He's, in a lot of ways, the, the rocky road to Tony Musket's vanilla. And I'm not trying to throw shade on Musket, 
But yeah. Musket is, and he, he's welcomed this uh, moniker. He's a game manager. He wants to be the point guard of the football team where he, he spreads the football around. Doesn't beat himself. Doesn't beat himself. Where Calandria plays like every snap is his last snap living on this planet. Yeah. And because he plays that way, I can't keep my eyes off him. Yeah, and nor can anybody else. I mean, we've heard the TV announcers watch him and, and just – rave gush about him yeah they gush about him this this kid doesn't play like a freshman yeah and uh even malik washington said late in the scene he says we got we got to stop calling this kid a freshman he's not a freshman anymore and uh the once he the game slowed down for him and he stopped making some of the mistakes that he was making uh, we saw some possibilities in him and uh, you really can't judge him off that Virginia Tech game because he was running for his life. Uh, he had no protection. No yeah. protection. That's something that they need to do is is try to build that offensive line in the future to to keep him clean. Um, we'll highlight some of the viewers and listeners watching the program, then we'll get to your comments. How about this comment from Grayson, who's watching in North, Down, North Downtown right now? Um, love the show, guys. He says, I saw the Nebraska head coach say that any quarterback who enters the portal is worth a million, a million five to two million dollars right now. Calandria would seem like the guy that could get a million, a million five or two million. How in the heck is Virginia going to keep him around when, there, when there's that kind of money around for quarterbacks? Well, he's right. Matt Rule did say that. Uh, he said if, if you want to go into the portal for a quality quarterback, it's going to cost you at least a million dollars, up to three. Um, I've heard a lot of interesting things in, since I saw you last year. I, I heard, heard third hand that, that Liberty has a $10 million NIL program. Get out of town. Uh, you look, I mean, you, you think about it now. Liberty's. Liberty has got a lot of money. They got a lot of money. They got a lot of money. I, I don't know if it's true, but I heard that each one of their offensive linemen makes a minimum of 50000 a year. A lot of folks don't realize this, that Liberty's student body, what you see on campus is a fraction of the actual student body because of its diligence and infrastructure with doing online learning. Liberty don't they is, have over 100000 online? Uh, yeah, vast students? online learning. And they pay the same tuition, I think, as... On, uh, live bodies on campus. There you I go. Think. Bingo right there. Um, a $10 million NIL fund for football. That's what I heard. Now, I, that was told to me third hand by some people who attended the Liberty uh, game this past weekend when they won their conference championship. Um, my son Scott, who did not tell me that, well, covered that game. Uh, but anyways, um, and, you know, they're not bound by, I don't think, they're not a state school. They're a private institution, so they don't have to go by these, the state laws, right? Um, but uh, what's going to keep Calandria here should he choose to stay? And I'm not, I'm not saying, I don't know that. I haven't talked to him. but he, I mean, this guy's got $2 million upside. Yeah, but I, I think his family is not hurting. I don't know what their wealth is or anything like that. None of my business, but uh, I think they're doing pretty well for themselves. I don't think he would leave here because of money, because of the same reason Arch Manning wouldn't leave Texas because of money. They don't don't doesn't need the money. It's not the incentive. Um, if he would leave here, I think it would be because he's either a unsatisfied with his role or the coaching staff, or B, he wants to go somewhere where he can compete for a, at a higher level in terms of for a big bowl or a playoff. Uh, I think that's what would motivate him. I don't think it would be money. Uh, that's why I think he's staying put. Kevin Higgins, watch it in Greenwood, Virginia. UVA football lost five games by a total of 17 points by right. a second-year coach that experienced a mass murder um, in his first year. As a coach, they are his kids. And look at Clemson's season after he left. I think Elliott is going to end up being one of our best coaches ever. Uh, he also says, living in almost is okay. 
It's an opportunity to explode. Our fans live in almost every day. Step up Charlottesville and support this team. Kevin Higgins right there with his perspective. James Watson will get to the comment here. He says, it's interesting how Brendan Armstrong played a similar style and everyone said it would not work under Tony Elliott, but yet it is working for Calandria. In 2019 and 2020, Armstrong looked very similar to Calandria, but taller. You want to break that comment down? Well, I, I don't think Brandon Armstrong, uh, when he was here under Tony, I, I don't think, I think Brandon had an exceptional year as a sophomore. Right, yeah, well, sophomore compared to, you know, you get all these extra years now, but um, the, the year he, he led Virginia and led the nation in passing a lot, I think that was more of the system than, I th than it was Armstrong. We, I think we saw that bear out at NC, NC State, State this yeah. past year and last year here. Um, he's not an NFL quarterback. No. Uh, he had an exceptional year. I, I won't take that away from him. I, I, I like Brendan Armstrong a lot. I think he's a great kid. I have a lot of respect for him. I just don't think he was as good as he had, as his year was that year. Brennan doesn't have the arm talent that Anthony Calandria does. No, he doesn't have the arm strength. The accuracy. I, I, and uh, even though Calandria was a freshman, I think he – and I won't say he was a lot better at reading coverage and stuff. I think he will be as he grows. Uh, I don't. That was. I don't think that was one of Brendan Armstrong's strengths, and I think he would get happy feet. Um, Calandria does that because out of necessity, more than anything. And being fair to Armstrong, he 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 had to go through some of that at both places. Uh, neither school had great offensive lines. Um, but yeah, I. I, I I see what he's saying and the similarity in the fact that they are dual threat guys and are are kind of the gunslinger types. I think Calandria, while he will keep that and it's one of his strengths, I think he will control it better and succeed more with his passing skills than, than Brendan Armstrong did. Uh, um, in the long run, the, he had better numbers than Armstrong this year in terms of uh, if you look at, at everything broken down, particularly when they played against each other and then <clears throat> as they went moved forward. And Colandria didn't play obviously as many <clears throat> games as uh, as Armstrong did. Uh, we'll highlight um, Alex Brown watching the program in Stratford, New Jersey. I see eight states on the Jerry and Jerry show right now, viewers and, and, and listeners. The, and the one guy that had made the comment before, he was right about. Kevin Higgins. Yeah, he, he was right about what Tony Elliott has gone through. Uh, no coach in America has gone through this. Has gone through what Tony Elliott has gone through. I don't know if they ever have. But they, no time in, in recent times has there been a mass murder of players on a team and then deal with that as a first-year coach, uh, have to deal with all the migration that he had to deal with that first year because a former coach sabotaged the program and the recruiting and then had a running back uh, face near – uh, paralyzation during the season this year like they did with Paris Jones and, and uh, thank God that he's back home and and on his feet and uh, working toward being restored um, and uh, I haven't looked at his GoFundMe page but uh, last time I looked they were they were close to their goal so I, I hope that they they met that but uh, no coach in America has had to deal with what he's had to deal with and you you got to give him some slack for that. I mean, it's just so uncommon. And I, a lot of my friends, because I've been in this business all my life, a lot of my friends are coaches in various sports all over the country, and they've all told me, I can't imagine, I can't imagine going through what Tony Elliott and his coaching staff have gone through. It's just unfathomable. And... 
you got to cut them some slack for that. Uh, you know, there's been times where his teams didn't look prepared, and 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 he owned that. I'll give him credit for it. But uh, my goodness, I mean, put yourself in his shoes, and how would how would you lead a hundred and some young men through all this? It's it's got to be a, just incredible pressure that never leaves your mind. Uh, it's hard to sleep at night. Plus Jay Wolfuck leaving the program in a lurch to focus on baseball. Yeah, I mean that. Plus the injury to Tony Musket, who yeah. was the backup, supposed to be the backup to Jay Wolfuck, thrust yeah. into the starting spotlight. Then Musket gets banged up. He had to deal with an offensive line that played hurt all year long. Yeah. Uh, lost some defensive guys some at certain times of the season when it didn't help any. And then, yeah, playing all these, uh, you know, like he said, he doesn't believe in moral victories, but they had they had a lot of moral victories this year. Uh, guys, you guys are responding incredibly well to the Jerry and Jerry show here. Ask us some questions. We'll relay them live on air. We'll talk basketball here at a matter of moments. Dot the I's and cross the T's here if we could. Hoodie on football. Potentially, I'm highlighting the word potentially, the transfer portal could benefit Virginia football this year, potentially. It, it, it could, and again, we've talked in the past about the restrictions that Virginia has, uh, and some credits simply won't transfer. Uh, if you look at the pool of guys that we're aware of that have either visited Virginia, some of them were, uh, their seasons were over earlier because they were from leagues that don't play 12 games and aren't involved in bowl games. But uh, a lot of these kids that have been here and have been offered, uh, there's th three Ivies that I'm aware of. Uh, got Penn, you got Harvard. Tight end from Harvard. Yep. Um, a guy from Penn, a guy from Cornell, a guy from VMI. And uh, two of the guys that stand out the most, I guess, is, is a defensive back from Georgia Tech who was offered. And Notre Dame's leading receiver, Chris Tyree, this past season. He uh, played in 12 games, had 26 catches for 484 yards, 18.6 yards to catch, three touchdowns. Was a four-star recruit coming out of Thomas Dale High School in R or Richmond area. Um, and Calandria was actively <laughs> recruiting yeah, him as soon I as the guy. As soon as the guy announced he was entering the portal, Calandria sent him a tweet and said, "Let's do it, number four. <laughs> so uh, you can tell where he, what he's doing. He's he's recruiting the heck out of that kid. He he sees him as a guy he could potentially fulfill uh, Malik Washington. I read role. your story. I'm on JerryRackliff.com every day. That tweet gave me confidence that Calandria is committed to the program because this guy is yeah, utilizing. Going somewhere, there it is. He wouldn't be trying to get recruited out of the players. There it is. Here. There it is. That's that's how I interpreted it. I understand things could change, and if you're 18, 19, 20 years old, and someone dangles a, a sack of $2 million in front of you. It could influence your decision making. But when I read your story and I, when I hopped on his social media and I saw that, I thought, this man's committed to the program. I, I'm in total agreement with your analysis. And, and, and maybe we're, we're talking about the wrong guy transferring. Maybe it's Musket that's the one that says, look, Calandria is clearly the guy here. Do I want to come back and what would that be his... Six year, I mean, this fifth year. I, I mean, I, I lose count. I don't know either. Uh, the, this COVID thing, it's bananas. Extra COVID year is. I mean, there was a NC State guys, I think playing in his seventh year. Played in, so I think he yeah. might be coming back for an eighth. Yeah, this maybe maybe it's musket. That's the maybe, guy. but you know everything I've heard about him is he's happy here and. You know, he probably figures well. I, I beat him out this past year. Try it again. Job. I'll, yeah, why not? Yeah, and they're they're good friends. I think they really support one another from everything I've heard, and have great admiration and respect for one another. So, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they both if they're both back. That'd be very nice for this program and Tony Elliott if they're both back. We'll talk basketball. Uh, this question came up on the I Love Seville show yesterday for you. 
is Virginia men's basketball a top 25 team right now? Now we have to clarify, uh, they were asking this question on eye test uh, because Virginia men's basketball is in the receiving votes portion of both polls. They got one loss on the season, a terrible loss to Wisconsin, where they did not get off the bus. Besides that, they look like they're playing better basketball as the season matures. The victory against Syracuse was one of the most prolific offensive outputs for, what, 75% of a contest that I've seen. Uh, Virginia basketball is flirting with a 30-point lead. Tony Bennett empties the bench and gets much-needed playing time for players 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, maybe even 13 on the depth chart. Uh, and then the wheels came off a little bit. But for 75% of that contest, this basketball team looked absolutely dynamic. Yeah, and Syracuse had just done the same thing to LSU in the ACC SEC ch big uh, challenge. Uh, just rolled over them. Um, and Wisconsin is legit. I mean, they beat Marquette the other day, so uh, that shows that that wasn't a fluke. Uh, Wisconsin's a good basketball team, and, and Tony Bennett said that they were pretty solid, and he knows basketball yes, he as does. well as anybody. So um, if Duke is a top 25 team, Virginia's a top 25 team. Virginia has a, a much better record against uh, good programs than Duke does. Duke – lost two games to unranked teams uh, in their last couple of outings. So uh, Duke came in at 22, I think. If, if Again, if Duke's a ranked team, then Virginia should be a ranked team. I don't really worry about those things right at this point of the season. Too I, early. I used to be an, an AP voter in football and basketball for years, and the, the reason I stopped was because – Back when I voted, they didn't make your votes public, and now they do, and it's not worth the hassle you get from fan bases all over the country. Put that in perspective. It, yeah, yeah. I mean, What's if, the feedback you get? If, if you don't rank a Kentucky team or a West Virginia team where they, their fans think they should be or, or you rank somebody ahead of them that they don't, you may get – 400 emails in your inbox and believe me some of them are vile and I don't know anybody on earth that enjoys no. getting beaten up uh, by anonymous uh, gutless wonders out there so keyboard muscles them. keyboard muscles yeah, yeah. Um, we see a lot of that on message boards as well a lot of idiots like that but uh, um, it's it's not worth the hassle but uh, you know I, and I always wondered uh, when I was voting, still do. Uh, top 25 polls at this time of the year don't mean jack. Uh, you look at them now and you look at them in March. Completely different. Completely different in yeah. most cases. I mean, your, your power, it's like college football. Most of, your, most of the teams that were ranked in the top 25 in the 60s and 70s are still ranked in the top 25 in the 2023. Um, those are programs that are long invested, incredible fan bases, lots of money, lots of prestige, a lot of power. Um, those things usually don't change. Sometimes some new people will come in and make an appearance, but it's generally the same schools year after year after year. I, I just, I just don't. I, I've just noticed from Virginia through the years. I, I think they play better when they're not ranked. Yeah, because they don't I have the bullseye. I think they stay hungry. Yeah. Uh, I think it puts a target on your back, and people want to knock you off. Hey, we got number twelve Virginia coming in. Let's see if we can ruin their season or whatever. Uh, I just I think it's I think it's good to be unranked until when it matters. Uh, I, if I was Virginia, yeah, sure, it's cool, it's prestige, yeah, people are looking at you. I, I don't. I, I just think in the long run, you're better off, and you stay more hungry if you're not ranked. I I, I wouldn't be a, if I'm a Virginia fan, 
I wouldn't be upset about not being ranked. I'll, I'll ask you this question then. Virginia, and we'll take a look at the uh, ACC standings right now. Uh, the Wahoos 7-1 and one overall. 1-0 and in conference play. Carolina, 7-1 and one overall, 1-0 and in conference play. Clemson, I mean, Clemson right now, the only unblemished team in the conference. 7-0 and oh overall. And that's not unusual. 1-0 in oh conference play. For absolutely, absolutely. Uh, who's the best team in the conference right now? You say Carolina clear cut? I would say Carolina right now, yeah. They've, they've had some pretty good wins. Um, they've struggled a, a little bit at times, but I, I, they've had some pretty convincing wins. And uh, is it, have they played UConn yet, or is that tonight? Let's see. I'll call up the schedule for Carolina right now. Madison Square Garden. They got uh, UNC. has got UConn. Look at you, Hootie. You followed is that tonight? closely. It's tonight, my yeah, friend. I thought that was tonight. In the Big yeah. Apple with a 9 o'clock tip. Huge, my huge My game. better half, uh, a UConn graduate. If we can stay awake, you remember these days with the five-and-a-half-year-old and a, a one-year-old who wakes up in the 4 a.m. hour every single damn day. We may watch this with a 9 o'clock tip if we can stay awake. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll be interesting. Our one-year-old literally has woken up in the 4 a.m. hour for 375 straight days. Wow. Uh, uh. I've, I've lived through that, I know you <laughs> so I know, I know, you I know where you're coming from. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's a huge game tonight. And um, defending national champion against uh, a really good North Carolina team in Madison Square Garden. I know. Uh, I've, the I've, cathedral. I've heard uh, from my friend who covers the Tar Heels that they've been talking about that for days, playing in the Mecca of – College basketball against the defending national champion. So, yeah, uh, we'll we'll find out a lot, a little bit about North Carolina tonight in that game. But I, I'd say right now they're the number one team in the conference. Um, I have to highlight Isaac McNeely, uh, McNeely against Syracuse. I mean, what a what an outing! Um, this you know this says something. He's a second year, but he's the most experienced, the second most experienced player on the roster, behind Beekman. Um, Isaac McNeely looks bigger than last year. He's mm. put on some muscle. He is playing with more confidence. He is not deferring. He is realizing that he might be the best perimeter scorer on the team. Um, and I think you put all those elements plus the coaching staff supporting him, and you see a budding superstar here. Where do you want to go with Isaac McNeely? Uh, I, I, I really like this team. I, Me not, too. Not just as a player. I, I, I like them as individuals. So we've gotten to talk to them a little bit, and they all have such great personalities. Uh, they kid around a little bit with the media. Some of them do. Uh, some of them aren't used to being around the media that much, and I think – they're starting to warm up to us a little bit, but I, I, I absolutely love Isaac McNeely. I, I got to know him a little bit long distance uh, when he was still at, at Polka High School in West Virginia, the Polka Dots, uh, one of the greatest nicknames for a school in, uh, in the country. I uh, got to know his mom a little bit through Twitter. Uh, he's was on uh, some of my podcasts while he was still in high school. His coach is one of these legendary uh, guys, uh, uh, just a good old guy, country guy, uh, been coaching all of his life, um, has all the great sayings that you, you love talking to old coaches, uh, just just a great friendly dude. Um, I could see McNeely's greatness then. And I, I just knew he was going to be outstanding. And he – that has come to bear. And he's only going to get better. I mean, he is shooting 54%. That's ridiculous. From three-point arc as we speak. 54%. And he – he finally got some shots the other day. I don't, I don't think they get him enough shots. Amen. Um, Amen. Amen. Tony, you were a three-point shooter. I know you want to give this guy some more opportunities. Um, He's shooting 45% from the floor, 54% yeah. plus from downtown, 80% at the stripe. I concur with my friend here. Get this guy more looks. Let's see what happens if he gets even more looks. Yeah, and... Um, Averaging almost 12 a game. 
and uh, I, I would get him more shots because uh, he's going to make them. And he, he's, uh, he has a little bit more of a repertoire now. He worked really hard in the offseason in every aspect of his game, not just with his shot. And he gets up extra shots. And believe me, he, this kid's a worker. You're not going to outwork him. He's more willing to put the ball on the deck yeah, he, and try to get to the hoop a little bit more. Exactly. And he's a little more athletic than he was. He's stronger, as you pointed out. I think he's put down five or six pounds of muscle. Yep. Uh, he f- feels like he moves better. And while we focus on his offense, his defense has gotten better too. He He's usually assigned the second leading scorer on the other team. And that – you have to get a lot of trust from Tony Bennett to get an assignment like that. It's automatic who's going to guard the number one guy. Sure, Mr. Beekman. Mr. Beekman has just made people look silly so far this season. How about his uh, his stat line against Syracuse? Reese Beekman, 13 points, eight dimes, no turnovers. Right. 13 points, an assist-to-turnover ratio of eight to zero. He had a rebound. He had a block. He had a steal controlled the outcome of the game, finished five of seven from the floor, two of two from the stripe. I mean, it was just absolutely dynamite. And only played 25 minutes. And played 20, 20, yeah, 25, 26 minutes. I mean, this team, I'll throw this to you and I'll get out of your way. When McNeely's shooting like he's shooting, it makes Rody better. It opens up uh, attacking lanes and mm-hmm. driving lanes for everybody else. Exactly. Makes Don look, I mean, Don plays better. He can crash the boards. He can do what he can in the, you know, in the paint, going to the rim. It just takes so much. It creates open jump shots for Groves. Um, I know Beekman is the most important player on this team because he's the point guard. He's the leader. But McNeely may play a role where he is the, how would you characterize it, Hootie? The anchor? There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's true. Excuse me. <coughs> Got to sneeze. Uh, pardon me. Um, yeah, I, I, there's no question about that. And and another thing we we didn't mention about that Syracuse game is that he guarded Judah Mintz, uh, who scored 33 against LSU. Against Beekman, he had – in 26, almost 27 minutes, he made two of eight shots. Yep, five points. Five points. Nothing from three-point land. Uh, had one assist, one turnover. Uh, that's putting the handcuffs on somebody. And he did the same thing in the game uh, previous against Texas A&M and completely shut down Wade Taylor. Two of ten. This guy was averaging 20-some points a game. Uh, four points, one of six from three-point line, four assists, five turnovers in 36 minutes. Uh, Bigman is playing lights out defense. Lights out. Like, I mean, I mean, he's. I know that some of these national experts didn't have him as one of the top ten defensive players in the country in their preseason projections, and that's hogwash. I mean. He may be the best defensive player in the nation. In the nation, period. Yes. I mean, you're talking about the rating defensive player of the year here. This question from Jennifer watching the program. Please have Hootie compare and contrast Reese Beekman to Malcolm Brogdon. I see a lot of similarities there. Ask him his take on that. Huh, I haven't thought about that. Um, I think they're a little bit different in terms of their build. Brogdon's a better shooter. <clears throat> Brogdon's a better shooter, a more aggressive shooter. Yeah. And I, and I think that... And I think Reese is better about that this year than he has been because I think when he went to the NBA Combine, he got that feedback and was competing against guys who were trying to make a name for themselves and get drafted. I think he realized that he's going to have to be more of a an aggressive force on offense, and I think that's why currently in the latest. NBA mock draft I saw that he was ranked 38th and Ryan Dunn was ranked 18th because Ryan Dunn is more aggressive with the ball and 
attacks more. And, and I think that uh, their games are, are different, but uh, I, I, think that's, I think that's the main difference between Beekman and Brogdon is that Malcolm hunted his shots more, uh, better three-point shooter, more aggressive with the ball, and it's something that I think that Beekman will probably grow into as the season goes along. They need for him to score, <clears throat> particularly in big games. I completely agree with that take. Um, if you're being compared to Malcolm Brogdon, that says something about your game. And Mr. Beekman is playing some, some lights-out hoops right now. You talk Gertrude and a red shirt burning. Um, you surprised by the move to burn Elijah Gertrude's red shirt? Um, also upside for Elijah Gertrude. He's showing some flashes of uh, explosive athleticism um, so far. The question I have, so it's a two-part question. The first part is, you surprised with the red shirt burn. And the second part of the question is, what happens when Harris gets healthy and comes back in the lineup? Where are the minutes in the backcourt? That's a really good question. <clears throat> and I don't know if I have an answer for that. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not... Don't even it's have a good to, spot for Coach Back. Have to figure that's a uh, a luxury that most coaches don't have. But um, I think they were debating even before the injury to Harris. I know they were. They were talking about possibly lifting the red shirt because he's so athletic and he can he can add to your team. And I know they already are playing eight, nine guys, but it, it's hard to ignore that kind of athleticism. I mean, I, I don't like red-shirting guys unless they really need another year. Um, I think that Leon Bond last year felt like he needed another year because he needed to build his body, and he had to prepare himself mentally for – for the, uh, this kind of competition, and, and he admits that he, he welcomed it and feels like it helped him tremendously. And we can, we're can we seeing some of that now. And, and I think he's going to be outstanding before the year's over as well. But um, when Harris went down, I, I didn't think it was any surprise at all that and, and we didn't know that Harris went down. It happened in practice. So when he showed up on crutches at the game, everybody was wondering what was going on. But um, I wasn't surprised at that point because uh, I interviewed – well, I know Doug Smith that played for Virginia, played for Jeff Jones, and he lives in Jersey City, and he's had an eye on this kid for a couple of years. And he told me – Gertrude. Before Virginia was even recruiting him. Yeah. yeah. He said – he said, Jerry, this, this guy is more athletic than anybody Virginia's had in the last 30, 40 years. Yeah, wow. And Jeez Louise. I mean, I, that, and you're talking Justin Anderson. That, that you're blew, talking Adam Hall. Yeah. That blew my mind. Yeah. I mean, there's been some great athletes in this program. And I had to see it to believe it. But – and I talked to Gertrude's high school coach up in Jersey City as well, and, and he told me the same thing. He said he he, he just uh, – he's so explosive. It, it takes nothing – he's like Superman. He he doesn't even have to – he just lifts himself. <laughs> His elevation is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. And he gets up so quickly. And uh, the two guys that you just mentioned are the only two guys that I – can think of that did that. I mean, Ralph did as well. But he's also seven foot uh, plus. Seven foot yeah. four. Right. Um, but uh, these, uh, yeah, Anderson and Adam Hall, uh, I mean, it just exploded off the floor. And that we, we've seen that in Gertrude already, a couple of block shots and rebounds that he's gone up and gotten. They're just. Left you jaw gape. Yeah. I mean, they do the replay at JPJ on the big screen and people just go, Ooh, right. <laughs> yeah, they can't believe it. Right. And uh, I find myself doing the same thing. It's just, uh, it's uncanny. So here's the follow-up question then. What does this mean for Dante Harris? Uh, because Dante, and, and look, Dante came to the program with some notoriety from Georgetown. Had a fantastic Big East tournament when he was with the Hoyas. The MVP. MVP of the As tournament. A freshman. Jay Willie, Coach Wilford said on the Jerry and Jerry show, 
that this guy is a better, I think, I don't even think I'm paraphrasing here, better on-ball defender than Kihei Clark. Yeah. Um, and he has been pretty good. Has been pretty darn good. The question I have for you on Dante Harris, he's shown flashes. He hasn't played that much. I would say they're flashes. Are Harris's minutes potentially cut here with Gertrude getting some playing time? Gertrude's 6'4". Harris is six foot, standing on potentially half of the yellow pages. Mm -hmm. Gertrude looks like a legit 6'4". Yeah, I think he is. Looks very physical. Are Harris's minutes about to get cut here? That's a good question, and, and probably so. I mean, there's only so many minutes to go around. Because Beekman's there, McNeely's there. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, he's, he's essentially playing a four-guard lineup. Right. Anyways. With Rhodey. With, uh, with Rhodey. And, uh, yeah, probably. I mean, uh, he, can, he does have the luxury of rotating these guys in and out because some of their positions are interchangeable. And he can just throw fresh legs at you for 40 minutes, which is incredible bonus to have. Uh, he can just rotate those guys in and out, play them together. Um, but, yeah, minute, minutes are going to be more precious to come by. For, Especially for with ACC things. season coming. If he can continue to grow. And um, I, Harris, it sounds like a pretty nasty ankle. Uh, so he might be out for a while anyways. But uh, when he does come back, uh, yeah, I, I imagine – his minutes will probably be cut down some, but I think Tony will try to work to find a balance to where all of them will be getting pretty decent playing time. Here's a follow-up question, tough question. What's your starting five? Now that we have what? Close to a – we have an eight-game sample. Mm -hmm. What's your starting five now eight games in? What are your first two guys off the bench, three guys off the bench? When we started in the season, and it wasn't just us, it was everyone, Jordan Minor, a lot of folks said, may crack the starting five. Right. Looks like Mr. Minor is, is, is um, the speed of the game, maybe impacting Minor getting some minutes. We underestimated the impact Buchanan could potentially have. Still, I'm curious to see the impact Buchanan will have come conference play when it's a much more physical game inside. Buchanan's physicality is certainly something we're questioning right now. Um, Gertrude was never a factor when the season started. True. Leon Bond has some upside right here. I think Leon Bond's trying to figure out his role for this basketball team. And we thought when the season was going to start that Dante Harris could contend for starters minutes but so far, Dante hasn't really cracked that starting lineup, nor has he gotten significant minutes. So here's the two-part question. You're starting five as we head into ACC play, and then your first two, three guys off the bench. Well, I think, I think for a while now, I think it's going to... Groves, uh, Rody, Don McNeely, Beekman? Yeah, I, th I think okay. he's going to stick with that. Okay. Because um, Groves looks better as a starter. Yeah, I mean, he's 6'9". He's a, he's a pretty good-sized well-built kid and uh he can play decent defense he, he's uh his shot has come around he's become more aggressive on offense um all five starters played uh 30 or more minutes against a and m and um even in the route against syracuse i think 21 minutes 22 minutes was the least amount that they played before he started substituting I, I think Buchanan uh, and Gertrude and Bond are the three that are going to come off the bench uh, until Harris uh, is recovered from his ankle. A uh, wing, a guard, and a post. Yeah. And, uh, and I think sometimes whoever the opponent is is, is going to dictate how much playing time Buchanan gets if they're going up against a bigger lineup, say maybe North Carolina or somebody of that ilk who has a big man to contend with because um, they're going to have to double the post. and Not that they can't do it without a, a big man, but it certainly helps when you have a guy with 6'11 size. And I think Buchanan is, is you know, he's, he's a freshman. He, 
he's going to get better as the season goes along. He's getting some nice minutes and experience. Um, I think the upside for Gertrude and Bond are both incredible, and we're going to we're going to see them get dramatically better as the season goes along. And what Tony told us in Charlotte before the season, I think, is is something that we should all hold on to is that the team you see in early November is not the same team you're going to see in early March. This, this team is going to get nothing but better and better and better. I love it. Jerry Ratcliffe, jerryratcliffe.com. He's a publisher. Some closing thoughts on Virginia hoops. Virginia's got a – I'll give you the schedule, Hootie, before we get out of here. Then you go anywhere you want. Any topic you want to cover here, jerryratcliffe.com, guys. Check the website out. I'm on it every single day. you got North Carolina Central, a rent a victim tonight, John Paul Jones Arena. you got Northeastern Saturday, Memphis in Memphis a week from today, Morgan State, December 27th, two days after Christmas, John Paul Jones Arena, Notre Dame in South Bend, last game of 2023, Saturday, December 30th. Anywhere you want to go on basketball or any team you want to cover. Well, they, they should get through most of this unscathed, I believe. Um, I, I haven't kept tabs on Memphis. I don't know exactly what they're doing. They're, they're always a, a good basketball team, and you're playing them at their place. It won't be easy. Um, I don't think they're accustomed to playing a team that plays defense like Virginia, so that could – unsettle them even if on their home floor. Uh, they should get through the rest of these games without any issues. Notre Dame is not a very good basketball team. They're probably one of the worst teams in the ACC. And so it could be another Syracuse-like game uh, in, in that uh, regards. I, I don't think they're going to – other than Memphis, I don't think they'll be tested again until we get into January and start playing – in the heart of the ACC schedule. Memphis and the receiving votes of both polls. I concur with Hootie right there. Uh, my friend, 1130, time flies when you're having fun. I think you're doing a hell of a job with the website. You churn content um, like no one I've seen, uh, football and basketball. It is impressive. Um, I'm following your website, jerryratcliffe.com, for Transfer Portal News. For this commitment Virginia got for the class of 2025, a quarterback, quarterback. as you've highlighted. How about that? Four-star quarterback. Four-star quarterback who had legitimate offers, dual-threat mm -hmm. quarterback. Beat out the Hokies for him. That's what I'm saying. You reported that extremely well. Um, any stories you got in the hopper before we close the show? Um, no, not really. We're. Um, I'm going to be doing something, I think, more on Beekman and McNeely as the week goes on. Uh, we're getting ready to hit the exam break, so there'll be, what, 10, 11 day period without any games? Uh, oh, that's Liza, <laughs> the mascot. <laughs> I know. Got a tough <laughs> Eliza took a, a little bit of a tumble. For there. those that don't realize <laughs> or don't know what we're talking about, there's a studio dog named Liza, a rescue from caring for creatures in Fluvanna County. We and, love uh, Liza. We love Liza. She either shook her butt or shook her tail or she <laughs> may have taken a tumble. <laughs> uh, I love I that. She's showing her head over there to Hootie somewhere. I love that pup. Yeah. Uh, um, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, be an exam break. Um, <laughs> So we'll have to be a little creative to keep people coming back to the website, but we'll be looking at some of the Virginia basketball players. We'll be keeping a close eye on the portal. Uh, I imagine there'll be a lot of stuff going on there over the next week or two as we, uh, as we get thick into that. Um, we're going to be uh, exploring our, our podcast. We're, we kind of had to redo some things, so we're, uh, our podcast is going to get going again. We've got some interesting guests with Scott. Yeah, with yeah. my son, Scott, yeah. who's uh, really good at that stuff. Um, we'll have some interesting guests. That's good. Uh, and uh, just the norm. 
we'll, we'll be keeping our eye on everything. The, I, the uh, day and age of creating media on the regular, he and I know that extremely well. Um, Jerry Ratcliffe, the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, the namesake of jerryratcliffe.com. Check out the website, Judah Wickhauer, the director and producer. He's the uh, man. Liza, our assistant director, somewhere <laughs> in the background. This is the Jerry and Jerry Show. It's archived wherever you get your podcasts. I truly enjoyed today's program. It was fun to sit across from my friend. Thank you guys for the great questions, and we'll see you next Tuesday at 10.15 a.m. Take care, everybody. Hold on. That Liza. <laughs>